Well, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this special town hall on uh, the academic plan for returning in the fall. Uh, the purpose of this town hall is to answer questions, specifically those of faculty, about the ac academic plan and our return. First, before I begin, I know a lot of you are aware of a New York Times article just out citing 112 COVID cases at the Connecticut University system. Uh, I want to point out that the majority, 90 of those, were frontline healthcare workers who worked to save thousands of lives during the peak of the pandemic. Uh, like the state of Connecticut, UConn has fared fairly well in the, in the pandemic, um, at least in a relative sense. Not that we've been untouched by the virus, uh, but the case numbers on our campuses have been extremely low. Uh, recently, we just tested 400 uh, workers at Farmington at UConn Health, and we had not one uh, positive result. And for the second time, we've just tested 200 student athletes and coaches uh, that are on campus. And for the second time, not a single positive case. And if you've been following the news, this is quite out of the norm with our peers across the country. Uh, last spring in the dorms, uh, similarly, we had we cared for about a thousand students in our stores dormitories uh, after the spring break. And during that period from spring break to the end of, of the semester, uh, we didn't have a single positive case. Uh, at Stanford, we had one positive case and that case was isolated and prevented from spreading. Uh, over the summer in our research labs, we had one positive case and we immediately implemented the protocols that we'd put in place for that eventuality. Uh, we notified everyone in the lab, closed that lab for two weeks. Uh, fortunately, that um, that lab worker recovered well, and uh, we validated it to some extent that the protocol worked because it didn't spread to any other individual. So um, we're feeling pretty good about the protocols and the approach we have in place, but we know that the challenges before us are far greater uh, than the challenges we faced already. In fact, uh, we're approaching the most unusual and challenging semester in this university's history. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging and thanking uh, the faculty who are watching uh, today and with us today for all that you've done over the past months to prepare for a successful return uh, to instruction, both online and in person. Uh, I was walking with the governor in the park a few weeks ago, and he marveled at our ability and decision to give faculty a choice of modalities and at their response. And I was so proud uh, to share with him, you know, the commitment that I have observed uh, to the mission and to the value of a residential college experience that runs so deeply here among our, our faculty, staff, and students. And uh, uh, it's just, it's in incredible. And I'm, I think we're in a, in a, in, incredibly uh, good place right now under the circumstances, and I'm very proud. Uh, to get ready for our return, uh, a return that is both in-person and online, both residential and computer and commuter and safe, uh, it has required unprecedented preparation and collaboration across departments. As an example, I spoke recently to a, our student affairs team led by Ellie Doherty, and in that meeting, there were 50 people from 15 departments uh, on the team meeting, many who've never worked together before uh, directly and from all levels, uh, from senior staff, senior management to junior staff working side by side uh, and round the clock as a single team. It's quite inspiring to see and I'm, I'm very grateful to them. Um, many of our working group leaders are the unsung heroes of UConn, and I just want to take 20 seconds and mention some of those right now. So if you'll bear with me, uh, Mike Jednak and Aris Ristow, who lead facilities operations, Laura Crookshank and Maria Groza from uh, the, architect, the architect's office, Greg Bucco and Brian Lockwood in the registrar's office, the entire staff of CEDL, Greg Daniels, our chief procurement officer, Bill Shea, who leads emergency management, Rochelle Rubin, who has been our liaison to the governor's reopening group. Dr. Dina Casiero, who is the Director of Sports Medicine and Athletics, Michelle Williams in the OBPR's office, Michael Mandrain, who heads ITS, Peggy Selleck, our bursar, and finally, Tracy Anderson and the Web Development and Design Teams in University Communications, along with Stephanie Wrights and Emily Zangari, all of whom 
help us to get the word out about our efforts. I could go on for the remainder of the hour to thank everyone who deserves it, but I wanted to mention just a few of the group leaders as we started today, mostly because they work so hard for us behind the scenes. So with that, I'd like to turn this over to our new provost, Carl Lejway, who has hit the ground running. Uh, he, I am so impressed with how incredibly fast he's gotten his arms around the challenge of returning in the, in the face of COVID and has built trust with partners across the university. And I turn it over to you now, Carl. Uh, unmute. But. <laughs> <laughs> what a start. Okay, well, um, I have a very brief presentation and I will keep it brief because we know we want to get to as many questions as possible, but there's some things we just know are on your mind, so we wanted to go through them. So to begin with, in terms of general academic details, I want to be really clear that this has been a team effort. We have both an academic planning group and a subgroup of that on behavioral health strategies that have been completely aligned with the academic planning mission. There's been countless other uh, planning meetings across the other parts of the university, but specific to the academics, I want to be clear, I've been meeting weekly with your Senate or our Senate Executive Council President and, and all of the, the membership of that council. I've been meeting almost weekly now with the AUP. In fact, we just went through the slides together and they gave me lots of good suggestions. And, and a wide range of stakeholders. And so while we will never get everything right, I think it has been very clear how important including faculty, staff, and students and our whole community in the planning really is. In terms of the details that we have, uh, you know, some of you may already know this, but we've made the decision to have students come back two weeks early. We would stop at right before Thanksgiving, have online, for those remaining two weeks and exams and those remaining two weeks, which will include, because of the good work of the SEC, a reading period for students um, in those, those final uh, period after Thanksgiving. We'll have standard class times and time in between classes, but because of the, the strong staff that we have in place, if that proves to be problematic, we can always think about other strategies. CEDL has been involved from the start, providing support both in the front end of classes, but also will be there with you throughout. And as I, you'll see, there's lots of links on the presentation. The last page, I'll give you a, a site where you can go to actually pull up the presentation with the links. You will find lots of really useful information, including about all of the teaching modalities through CEDL. Okay, next, um, in terms of health and safety on campus, we are, you know, I wouldn't say the only, but among a small number of schools that have from the start said, if you are more comfortable and feel safer teaching online, we will support that. This is both for faculty and for graduate students. In terms of a shared responsibility for our community, uh, the Student Affairs has done an amazing job putting together the UConn Promise. You can see that there. It's, it's about not just all the things that we have to do, but what we can do to come together as a community to support our own safety, but also everyone's safety. Employees on campus for extended period of time need to be approved or registered. We want to maintain low density. We want to support contact tracing. There are uh, there's our approaches both in some of the individual schools and colleges and also at a university level for how to do this. This is obviously very different if you just need to come in for a book or for other things. This is if you intend to be on campus for an extended period of time, we wanna make sure that we're able to support safety in that way. And just to say it very clearly, masks and social distancing are required. So I don't have time to, uh, to go into the details of this, but I just want to show you the level of detail that's come from, from UPDC and FACOPS. This is an example of a classroom and the way in which it will be set up ahead of time 
for you to be able to teach in person for those of you who are and do it in a way where you can ensure there is six feet of distance between students. Here's an example in a larger classroom. It, it's really uh, very extensive, the work that's gone into this and the prep work that will happen before you get to your class. In terms of other health and safety resources, between what environmental health and safety is done, human resources, facilities operations, as I mentioned before, you'll be able to get almost any information you need here. If you want to have a plexiglass shield in your classroom, this you would go to facilities operations. The one thing we will say, we want to ensure that, that we're keeping in mind that we have a large community and if you don't need something, it's important not to request it because we want to make sure that we're able to get it to those who do need it. But if you do, we will try to do everything we, we can to ensure that your setup provides the safety that, that will allow you to do your job. In terms of testing and contact tracing, um, it's, as you know, we will have essentially a, a kind of baseline that we will set where we will have students and employees on our campuses tested at reentry. There are some links for details there. Our contact tracing for students will be done a little differently, but for faculty and staff, which is our, our focus today, it's done in collaboration with the state and with HR. And then a very important piece through all this is always being aware of what the state guidelines are. And one place is in terms of travel restrictions. And as you know, there are many states um, outside of Connecticut, if you were if you travel out to these states, there are quarantining expectations when you come back. Please make sure that you're aware of, of what those state guidelines are. So then in terms of, of specific things to instruction, um, there's again lots of links here. You will have lecture capture in many classrooms. This will allow you to really think about other ways to, to support a variety of, of students and learning experiences. We are now in the final stages of, of coming forward with a plan supported by IT. And I just want to mention the libraries, Lauren Slingloff, Slingloff and others who have done a lot of work, so that we will try to do everything we can that if you do not have what you need to teach online, that we will find a way to get it to you. This could come at some expense, but we think this is really important. So if you're having those concerns, please check out that link. In terms of the basic class guidelines, PPE, masks, there'll be lots of signage, room markings. There's a way in which you can request facility support. You can do that at the start of the year. If you change your mind and decide you want some later, you don't have to do it all up front. We want to be real thoughtful about limiting density to the extent that we cannot have guest speakers, lecturers, other things that could bring risks in terms of field trips. Obviously, we want to create the best learning experience possible and where you feel like something is important, you should reach out about it. But to the extent that we can acknowledge this is a different kind of year and we may want to want to truly cut back on those things that would be helpful. In terms of classroom cleaning, uh, we can't, it's just not feasible to do a deep clean between every class, but there will be for classrooms, bathrooms, common areas, um, a disinfection twice daily, and the rooms will have all kinds of disposable at, um, wipes and other ways in which um, individuals can ensure that they're keeping their, their space clean. Other things very quickly, we have lots of materials for your syllabus. This is where you can kind of set the tone for balancing safety and that academic environment. We know many of you are worried about academic integrity as it relates to exams being online. So we have some links there. Certainly reach out to CETL if you wanna talk through some strategies on that. Please think about how you'll have students enter and exit classrooms. We don't wanna be overly heavy handed and, and require things, but you may want to consider in some cases having assigned seats or having students enter and sit from the back. We're happy to help you think through what might make most sense. We also wanna rely on, on your skill and what you know as an instructor. 
One thing I think is really important is you want to have a plan for if you will, if you do miss classes due to illness, if, if students miss classes. One thing that is very important to clarify, because the rooms are set up with six feet of distance and masks are required, if a student in your class does test positive, they obviously will not be in the class, so we'll have that, that taken care of, but it is not the others are not considered to be contact traceable because they are not within six feet for 15 minutes. And so for your class, you will, you will largely not have many disruptions, but you do want to think about, like in any case, if you are ill, if there are other challenges, how you'll, how you'll be able to continue teaching. And CEDL has their great website on continue teaching to do that. The library has a lot of resources to ensure contact-free um, pickup and that you're able to get what you need, so be aware of that. And just for time, I just want to say one more time to really ensure that we're trying to provide the same support to graduate students, graduate student instructors that we are to faculty. Priority, prioritize safety with your in-person experiences. The one thing I will mention is that the fee waiver that we put in place, we did that to try to support two things. One, that we would reduce density and that some students who were on the fence but would be comfortable being online and not in person, that they had a reduction in fees, but also that those courses, those in-person courses, could then be shifted to other students who wanted more in-person courses. I know that for some of you, you've been asked to change to offer additional sections. We're not asking you to do that. Talk with your dean about it, your, your department head. We believe the, the waiver was an important thing to do, but we certainly did not want to make your lives more challenging. And then the last thing I'll, I'll say is we have to be aware of how we safely stay open, but be prepared if we can't. And so all of our working groups within a few weeks will move to shutting down working groups and we will do whatever we can to ensure that the, the plan that's put in place is, is thoughtful and well articulated. And the one thing I will say is what we aren't looking to do is have a particular number of certain number of people get infections or, but what makes sense in terms of keeping the campus open? Are we able to isolate those who are positive? Are we able to ensure safety? If we're able to do that, we will stay open. If we aren't, or if the state makes a decision or it's a federal decision, we will obviously comply with that. But we just want you to know we are thinking about it and I'll leave us on that. But just to say if you um, if you go to the provost site under communications, under provost messages, we have this presentation and you can download it and get all the links. And, and today is my first office hours. Uh, please, you know, sign up for those if you want to talk further about what we do. So thank you. And so we'll turn it over to questions now. Okay, thank you, Carl. We've been receiving a large volume of questions. I expect to receive additional questions during the broadcast. We'll try to address as many as possible that impact the broadest audiences within the 40 minutes or so we have remaining, and hopefully not repeat too much information already shared during this conversation. So we'll start with a few recurring questions we've received around testing and student life that actually may affect the broader community as well. First question, based on some recent reports, Students don't believe other students will be compliant with quarantine orders. What repercussions will be in place? How will they be enforced? Obviously, this is one of those questions that could apply to more than just students as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to chat about that a bit more. And for folks who don't know me, my name is Eleanor Doherty. I'm the Associate Vice President of Student Affairs and Dean of Students at UConn. And um, I'm, I'm grateful to the research that INSHIP has led for us, which has allowed us to use their expertise in behavioral health to understand the fears and concerns of students and to put practice in place that will allow us all to comply with what we need to do to be a safe and um, healthy community. 
Um, and so I'm aware there was there was some focus group work and there were some concerns about quarantine expressed. And I think it's also important to connect with the what we learned through a thought exchange, which involved thousands of students at an ideas lab, which involved our students, faculty and staff, which indicated that they want to return. Uh, they want to be on campus. They want to be safe and they don't want to put other people's um, health in jeopardy as well as their own. So then the question is, how do we um, have effective messaging and expectations expressed and have a student body and a faculty and staff body that is willing to participate in a healthy environment? And that means that the university needs to clearly express those expectations for mask wearing and physical distancing, being mindful of your own health and wellness and making decisions to inform your providers of when you're ill. You'll find those things are explicitly stated in the UConn Promise as well as modifying our own policies to ensure that for those who fail to meet those expectations, um, that we do have the ability to enforce if necessary. And certainly you'll see that we have put in health and safety uh, guidelines for our fall residential students that they need to agree to in order to live on campus. And if necessary, um, the university can utilize the student code of conduct for a student who is engaging in endangering behavior that could harm themselves and others. I do need to stress that we can trust the student body and we can trust ourselves to have compassion for one another and to engage in those practices that keep us safe and healthy. And we've seen it. We see our community members wearing masks. We see um, us maintaining um, our distance from our loved ones if we hear that they are ill and need to be isolated. And we build upon, I think, a reasonable good, a reasonable good faith to make sure that we have the best compliance. But if we need to, we have the tools in place to enforce. Has consideration been given to bringing back only Connecticut residents, perhaps including students from surrounding states with comparable COVID-19 levels? Bringing back students from across the country, especially from states experiencing exceptionally high incidents of COVID-19, may put all students, faculty, and staff at much greater risk and will increase the likelihood that the semester cannot be completed in person. Carl, Alyssa, that may be one that you, you both want to address. Yeah, I can start with this one. I, I think what's important is that by having that first set of testing, that baseline testing, and then having quarantining for that 14 day period for our students, we are creating a UConn baseline. And so with both of those things happening, we believe that we will have created the same level of safety as if we were only including our in-state students. And most importantly, we have a duty and an obligation to those students to try to provide them the best experience that that we can. If we couldn't do it safely, we wouldn't, but we do feel very comfortable with what we have, that we have not increased the risk by having our, our out-of-state students. Will there be testing for faculty who will be teaching remotely, but who will need to come to campus occasionally to get materials from their office? So what we are, what we are doing is, as I said, we have that that first baseline. And so if you are coming in regularly, whether you're teaching or not, you would be in that first baseline. If, however, you are coming irregularly, honestly, it really doesn't make sense to have that testing at that time. It doesn't add a whole lot. And, and what we would recommend is you Again, prioritize your safety when you come in, that you wear your mask, that you keep six feet of distance. And, and we believe that not having those additional levels of testing throughout the year for folks coming in occasionally, that this does not produce any additional risk. Carl, I'm going to keep you on hold for the next uh, couple of questions that have to do with, uh, with faculty in particular. First being, will there be extended options for testing during the first week of classes for faculty? So uh, what we've announced right now is that we have several um, dates and opportunities for faculty to be tested. We, just like 
with students. We expect our faculty to get tested in those periods. And that, that is, again, what I've said, that will allow us to create that baseline. What should a teacher assistant do if they do not feel safe teaching in person, but the professor overseeing the course is mandating in-person instruction? So as we've mentioned, we really want to make sure that we're providing the same respect to our grad student instructors that we are to our faculty. I've spoken with the deans about this issue, and they all have agreed that we need to take that same priority. And so as a student, we'd recommend that if, if you feel like you're being asked to do something that you're not comfortable with, that, that you follow your grievance procedures, you speak with your union, you, you bring those things forward because we do believe in, in the statement that we've made that we want to provide an environment where people can feel safe and comfortable in their instruction. What is the university's thinking about a ballpark number of confirmed COVID-19 cases to trigger canceling a face-to-face -face class meeting and similar, similarly of confirmed cases and or fatalities to trigger shutting down fall semester in-person instruction and interaction. I could take the classroom part. I, you know, I would sure. say again, because, and this is where I get why this can feel challenging or, or hard. This is where the state guidance becomes really important. If in your class you have, and this is why it's also important that you're not moving chairs around, that you're, you're not violating, the setting up the classroom in a way or moving the classroom in a way that violates the, the way it's been set up to observe the six foot social distancing. If we have that in place, if you have students wearing masks, if we have everything there, there wouldn't be a number that would trigger that. If there are any cases, we will obviously deep clean in that room. But the understanding is that for those individuals, they have not been at a level of contact that would put them at risk. Right. And if I could just add on uh, to what Carl said, this is Scott Jordan, um, Executive Vice President for Administration and CFO. Um, the university uh, will uh, be tracking a, a whole host of measures um, uh, on a daily and weekly basis and working with uh, with the state uh, to understand what uh, 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 what the what the trend is and what our expected ability to continue to maintain is we ha and there are a number of variables to track. We have set aside a certain number of beds in our residential uh, system uh, for uh, for six students, um, if that number of beds is overwhelmed, it is likely we would have to close. Um, we have a certain number of critical employees to maintain the operations of the campus. We'll be tracking their um, attendance uh, every day. And if we uh, if we cannot maintain the physical campus uh, uh, operations, then we would have to consider closure. So there is no one variable or one number that we will track. We will track across um, a whole host of variables and uh, the uh, gating conditions established by state government uh, with regard that, that are on the website and they begin with prevalence of disease, uh, test, uh, um, testing and contact tracing, et cetera, uh, to, uh, uh, to track our ability to, to maintain our operations. A live question we just got was, uh, does the info being shared already uh, today pertain to regional campuses? I believe the answer to that is yes, but if there's any nuance that anyone would like to uh, chime in on please feel free to do so yeah i can i can do that i would say in most cases it does and where it doesn't we've been working very closely with each of each of the regional campus directors to identify specific issues for those campuses as it relates to testing as it relates to ensuring regional campus students are able to get the courses they need to continue to progress. And so while you, it's hard to always think of everything, I, I know that Bill and Terrence and Anne-Marie and Mark are all thinking very deeply about this and they are not shy and they've done a really good job of, of pushing forward when there are cases where an overall plan doesn't work for their campuses and we are coming to, to good solutions in those cases. 
So here in stores with E.O. Smith High School at the southern edge of the Yukon campus, bringing students back to campus could pose a risk to the high school students and their families as commingling at store center directly across the street is inevitable. What policies and procedures have been considered to mitigate the risk? Scott, I don't know if that's one that you want to you want to take. Yeah, I, I'll start and I uh, uh, look for um, uh, Ellie Doherty or Dr. Arrow to to uh, follow on. Um, the first, the, the the first thing that we are doing is we are de we are calling it de-densifying our campus. Uh, we um, our residential system will have fewer than eight thousand students in it versus uh, normally twelve thousand. Um, uh, many many, if not most of our uh, our uh, class sessions will be conducted uh, online or remotely. Um, and uh, uh, folks in uh, Mansfield and in stores should expect to see quite a lot less activity in store center and around EO Smith and and uh, uh, and on campus uh, this semester. In fact, we we encourage uh, uh, people in the university community to uh, make sure that their uh, traffic is as light as possible. Um, uh, second, um, we are we've done the, all that we're doing, all the things that we've said that we're going to do, uh, set it, uh, baseline testing, um, uh, uh, care of our of our uh, student community through um, student health and wellness uh, testing and care available through that through them um, uh, testing of employees um, and uh, uh, and third uh, all of the behavioral uh, uh, things that we're doing requiring masks uh, creating uh, social distance uh, the the you promise that you know the the pact that we will make with each other as a community. Uh, to to stay safe and keep each other safe. Um, it is all of those things that will help maintain health and safety um, in store center and in the greater Mansfield community. Uh, we are part of the community. Uh, we're not separate from the community um, and we need to uh, all do do everything we can uh, to keep each other safe. We have three general questions around health and safety, so I'll call Dr. Alyssa Arrow to the virtual podium for those. The first would be, how will tests be mandated for students? Will they be expected to stay indoor until clear, or will they go about town putting the local community at risk? So, hi, I'm Elisa Arrow, the medical director here at Student Health and Wellness. And, um, in terms of our mandates for testing of, of incoming students, all of our residential students will be tested upon arrival to campus, and that's going to be followed by the 14 day quarantine that's been previously mentioned. Um, in that quarantine is going to be structured so that they can leave their um, residential spaces to um, obtain meals and engage in sort of limited outdoor activity. They're really campus based and doing all the things that Scott mentioned that will keep them safe during the quarantine, but also keep them safe as they move through the semester. Um, for our off-campus students, those who are gonna participate in in-person instruction have also been required to have testing. And those tests need to be obtained within 14 days of the beginning of classes. Um, and those results will be tracked for compliance, just like we do for, um, immunization compliance. So we'll use the systems that we already have in place to make sure that those students who have been asked to be tested have been tested and within the required time frame prior to classes. And then um, as mentioned before, um, these arrival testing strategies are really to set the new baseline for the campus. But then moving forward, we're really going to have ongoing surveillance testing of our residential students, which was a mandate of the gating conditions. Um, so there'll be weekly testing to sort of assess the health of our residential students. But we're also developing strategies to expand um, our testing and monitoring capabilities that will sort of wrap around and include some of our off-campus students as well. So there will be ongoing monitoring of the health of our students throughout the semester, even beyond the initial arrival testing. Why are students tested only upon arrival and not at regular intervals? So I think I rolled into that question a little bit. Um, 
and uh, the, they will be tested after arrival. So there will be ongoing strategies for surveillance testing throughout the semester, certainly focused ones on individual testing for residential students and broader systems monitoring that will definitely capture our off campus students. And then clearly anyone who experiences symptoms can receive you know, rapid testing and, and symptom assessment to keep them safe while they're on campus. Is there an expiration on COVID-19 test to be valid for returning in the fall? Uh, yes, yeah, so our arrival testing for residential will be upon arrival. Um, before they move into the residential housing, we've actually linked it to the check-in process. So students will not be allowed to move in until they have proof of that they have been tested. And then for our off-campus that have testing required, that will be the 14-day window prior to classes beginning. Great, we've actually received two live questions that I think fall into the same category, so I'll keep you on the hook a bit longer. Will the testing on campus be the type that gets results within 24 hours, or will there be the one to two week delay in results? I presume, I'm not sure if this question pertains specifically to students, but also important to apply to employees. No, you're right. There's been a big issue with um, delay in getting test results through a lot of our commercial laboratories. So we're partnering with Broad Institute um, and they have guaranteed testing results within 24 hours of the specimens arriving on site. So they will do a lot of our surveillance testing for us and definitely our arrival testing as well. We're also um, working to acquire point of care testing, which would give same day tests um, on site. So we have some um, capability of doing that now. We're looking to expand that capability as well. And Tyson, this is Chris Delello, Chief Human Resources Officer. With respect to employee testing, um, we are utilizing our colleagues at UConn Health to perform the test. And so far we've tested over the summer roughly 400 employees. And um, we continue to have a two to three day turnaround time. Are beds set aside for six, six students in a standalone facility or in a building that will also be housing relatively healthy students? That's another uh, live question. Yeah, we do have um, medical isolation beds set aside specifically for positive for students who test positive, and that is in a standalone facility uh, on campus. Okay, a couple employee specific workplace environment questions. Why are people that test positive for the virus allowed to be back to work in a relatively short time frame and without producing a negative test? Cristalello, uh, you might want to uh, take a stab at that. Sure, and I'll also invite our colleagues at UConn Health that were extremely helpful in developing the protocol. As everyone knows, the, the CDC continues to advise and provide guidance to um, workplace and employers on this point. Um, we have taken into account all of that guidance and we are following for people who test positive and are asymptomatic um, that there will be a 10 day um, time based strategy uh, for returning without a test, which uh, is in line with current CDC guidance. So I'd be happy to elaborate a little further. I'm David Bannock, I'm an infectious disease doctor here at UConn Health and our um, medical director for our infection control program. So um, it's, it's important to understand um, the test itself. Um, and I won't go into too much of the details on it, but essentially the test that's performed um, to diagnose active infection is a test for viral RNA. Um, it doesn't detect live virus. Um, so initially um, when this test was first available, um, patients were retested or um, individuals who test positive were retested um, until they were negative. But what's since been learned through several different studies is that the presence of um, viral RNA does not necessarily um, equal the presence of live virus and those patients aren't necessarily infectious unless um, they do have live virus. Um, so there've been several studies that have um, been done over the last several months that have shown that live virus um, is not cultured um, for ten, uh, after 10 days um, of an individual who tests positive, um, particularly one who is asymptomatic with mild illness. So that has actually been the scientific basis that's led to the evolution of the CDC guidelines that are now using a time and symptom based criteria rather than a retesting criteria. We know that the viral RNA can remain present for several months, but again, that doesn't necessarily um, mean that there is live virus and the live virus itself um, is only for 
um, up to 10 days. The previous message from the university seems to imply that there would be COVID testing for faculty who are not doing classes online. What if your course is being taught online, but you have been approved to come in for research or have department service obligations or just need to do other in-person things? Here we would come back to what I said in the presentation, which is if you are going to be here regularly and we expect you'll be tested, if you are occasionally coming in at other times in the semester, we wouldn't have you tested. And so if if you, you know, some have talked, have asked about can they teach an online course from their office? While we certainly want to reduce density, if that is the way in which you believe where you're going to be able to provide the best experience to your students, then we want to support that. You would be someone who would be, we'd expect to be tested. If you're coming in to get a book in October, we wouldn't expect. And, and to complement that, Carl, um, we have developed the on-campus registry program to ensure that we make available the tests that are being provided through UConn Health as, as our partners here. Um, over the last few days, we've assembled lists from the campus and we expect um, right now at least 40% of our campus population will be registered. Um, a majority continue to be on rotational um, assignments. So what we end up finding through this registry program that at any given time on our campuses, we would expect approximately 30% of our employee population um, to be there. And those uh, in the next day will receive information about the availability of tests, the timing of tests, and what will be required to schedule those tests. So I appreciate everyone's patience as we work through that. Okay, environmental health and safety might join human resources in addressing the next couple of questions. There have been cases of COVID-19 on the stores campus and people working in the vicinity of these individuals apparently have not been notified. Is there a way to alert workers about their personal risks regarding COVID exposure, possibly with positive outcomes without violating privacy policies? This is Terry Dominguez. I'm the Director of Environmental Health and Safety for UConn Stores and Regionals. Um, this might be something I might be tag teaming with Chris Delello on. Um, it's definitely a group effort. We, you know, recognize that um, that folks in the workplace need to be notified of a positive case, not necessarily the individual who tested positive, but of their of their ex potential exposure. Um, but the and and we're you know, there already is guidance in place that we're working to refine with our partners in HR, as well as with facilities in Shaw to make sure that uh, all the affected parties that need to be uh, contacted are. Um, the good news is because of the controls we plan to keep in place, and I believe uh, the provost mentioned this early on in his presentation, uh, the required use of face coverings, the social distancing, the uh, regular disinfection, all those, um, all those controls will preclude the um, consideration of a close contact having uh, been having existed in that space. Um, nevertheless, there's some guidance that will be provided to make sure people health monitor, and if they do develop symptoms, to report that to their supervisor, uh, etc. Um, any identified close contacts to that individual will be notified. Um, will be contacted through the Department of Public Health, uh, through our local health departments, through a um, statewide registry of positive test results. So that if there was someone positive in your workspace or, uh, or your area, um, and you have been identified as a close contact, um, you will be reached out to and um, provided guidance accordingly. Thank you, Terry. I think you summarized it nicely. Um, working with EHNS and the Department of Public Health and managers um, uh, in the communities that, that exist on our campuses, we will be working hard to identify those that have been um, in close contact 
um, with someone who has tested positive. Um, we have not um, over the summer addressed broad communication to all campuses um, of these cases. Um, our goal is to ensure the privacy of the individual and to ensure that symptom based monitoring um, is occurring for those that have been in direct close contact um, with the individual who's tested positive. Somewhat related to that question, uh, how will the disease burden in the Yukon community be publicly reported? Will there be a dashboard or reporting similar to that used by the state of Connecticut? Uh, I can actually tackle this in, in my capacity as vice president for communications. We're currently working on a template for regular mass reporting for the university's new service, Yukon Today, uh, which will be uh, duplicated on the COVID-19 resources website that's linked from the university homepage. Uh, in that reporting, we would be tracking aggregate numbers of positive cases, trends, and other metrics that uh, we believe the broad campus community, as well as the mainstream media, who will be tracking uh, college and university and public school reopenings uh, this fall. Uh, those would be things that they're interested in, and we'll be reporting that on a regular basis. Another question, uh, could you tell us if and how contact tracing will be implemented? Terry, that's that's probably a good question. Terry, I think you're on mute. You. Go ahead. I'm um, trying to turn it off. Yes, um, I'm happy to um, start that in a, in a general uh, term. Um, so contact tracing will be done um, by, by authorized contact tracers uh, working under uh, the authority of the state of Connecticut Department of Public Health. And um, included in that would be Shaw, uh, our student health and wellness, have contact tracers for their stores-based students. And for the rest of the university, um, the contact tracing will be conducted by authorized contact tracers, usually within the local health districts of where that individual resides. Um, that is overall what is happening. Now, what we have done is we've um, made sure we had this good collaboration or cooperative uh, uh, relationship with our local health districts for the regional campuses, as well as for our stores-based campus, and uh, specifically for stores-based, uh, we have our Eastern Highlands Health District, uh, Rob Miller, the Director of Health there. We're making sure that we're keeping in close communication and collaboration with him as many of the towns that, um, that report to the Eastern Highlands uh, will be um, uh, contact trace or the individual will be contact traced through his health district. Yeah, and, and this is Scott Jordan. I can report um, Terry and I met with him uh, just the other day. He is um, uh, he is gearing up. He's got five tracers on staff now and another five in reserve. Um, and is uh, we're we're fully integrated with him. Uh, important to note both to the answer of this question and the previous question is that. UConn is part of um, state government that we are uh, that the uh, we will have our own dashboard, but our number, all of our numbers get reported directly into the local health district and those numbers get uh, aggregated up into the state's numbers. So if um, uh, if if there's concern about uh, disease prevalence in the Mansfield area or in Stamford or uh, in, at Avery Point, um, our, our we are working. Uh, uh, hand in hand with local health officials to make sure uh, that uh, contact tracing and data reporting is fully integrated with the state system. Terry, I think we've spoken about this before to address some other concerns, but maybe for clarity, could you just define for us what actually constitutes a close contact vis a vis sure. those who may have been in contact? Sure, a actually. So a close contact is anyone who's been within six feet of an infected individual, so basically less than six feet, um, and it's that exposure time was more than 15, was 15 minutes or more. So as long as we have that, those controls in place at the university, we're maintaining all that uh, in a fixed manner in our classrooms, making sure there's six foot distancing, um, and, um, um, you know, we're minimizing our uh, exposure time with other people. 
uh, if it's less than the six feet, we want to make sure we do that. Um, but obviously, our face coverings are going to be very important too. Although the close contact definition um, is regardless of wearing a face covering, we, so we want to make sure that six foot distance is really maintained. We received a few questions about research, specifically about undergraduates that all re revolve more or less around the same theme. So it's encapsulated in this question, which I will uh, look to Rebecca Merrick, our Vice President for Research, to answer. Will undergraduates be allowed back in research labs and able to participate in activities as research assistants? So, how will the protocols for lab safety need to be updated? Yes, they will be allowed to be in the research lab, like the graduate students, they need to follow the safety protocol and do the COVID-19 training before they are allowed to be in the lab. They will be supervised and they have to follow the rules like, a, like um, all graduate students. So they will be approved by faculty who is in charge of the lab and they will be scheduled no more than two people or depending on the size of the labs how many people can occupy the lab but we are going to be mindful of the distance and all the time wearing the mask and it will be up to faculty to approve uh, undergrad to be in the lab so we have about seven minutes left in our allotted time and we have a number of general campus environment and instruction uh, questions that we can we can try to run through uh, pretty succinctly. I'll begin with one for uh, Scott Jordan. Can benches and other outdoor seating be increased on campus? Uh, targeting areas currently devoid of such seating and within Wi-Fi service, seeing as how being outside seems to be the safest approach. Um, a short answer, yes, and uh, we're we are in the process of uh, getting those benches ordered and uh, locating them around campus now. While it is impossible to predict the future with any degree of certainty, is it reasonable at this point to assume that we should plan to prepare spring 2021 courses to be delivered virtually? Yeah, I, I think one of the, the kind of constants of all this is, is to try to be prepared for anything. And if the work you've done now to start preparing courses for online, if work that you've done in previous semesters as we've started to have more online courses at the university. If there is work that you put into developing some online coursework, it doesn't have to just be for this semester coming up in the spring. It can be in a variety of ways that really can add to our overall academic mission. So I think it's a little early to say for sure. And you know, you probably don't have to complete uh, an, a full online course for the spring in the next few weeks, but it wouldn't be a bad idea. I think that that question has the right idea to start thinking about it and ways in which we can try to keep ensuring. We've always said balancing, right? We've said balancing safety with rigor. The more that we're thinking about this over time, the more whatever mode we end up in, we will have the greatest rigor possible. If an instructor of an in-person class needs to quarantine due to contact with someone with COVID, how will that class be handled? For example, will it be forced online for two weeks? Yeah, I, I think this is a case where we, it, we really will depend on that particular situation, just like any other case in any other semester where someone was ill. There, you could have um, someone uh, you know, who's within our community guest lecture for you. You could, we could find ways where you could pr provide your lectures not being in that space for a period of time until you're able to come back. It may be the case that we may have to cancel a few classes and we'd figure out ways to ensure that students are getting all the material that they need. I think one of the hard things about all this is, is understandably folks and i've got a lot of questions about this from aup folks are worried about responsibility and liability and and we want to as much as we can keep coming back to we have some of the best faculty in the world and you all are incredibly creative and thoughtful and i have no doubt we can work together with cedal with our office to figure out how to ensure that we can allow you time to to get better 
and ensure that we're supporting the students. But what we don't want to do is mandate something. It may feel safer now, but then it means you don't have that flexibility. Will faculty have the option to opt out of student evaluations of teaching this fall, similar to in the spring term, particularly given the number of courses that were converted to a distance learning or online format? So uh, this is Jeffrey Schulson. I'm the Vice Provost for Academic Operations. I can take that question uh, quickly. Um, it's a, it's a, uh, certainly an idea that we're, 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 we're willing to consider, but as in the case of the spring, we wouldn't want to take that step without ha having consultation with uh, the faculty union, with the AUP, and also with the, the Senate, because that's a decision that has lots of other implications, and we want to be sure that we are taking all of those into account before we make such a decision, but it's definitely something we'd be open to discussing. Okay, in the last couple of minutes here, we have a couple mask uh, related questions that environmental health and safety or perhaps Dr. Bonick might want to address. Will there be additional masks provided to instructors in the case of students forgetting their masks? Are instructors expected or empowered to ask non mask compliant students to leave the room? So, um, I would. You know, I would say that yes, if a student is coming in without a mask, that they should not be coming into that classroom without a mask. They should um, arrange to uh, acquire one. And certainly the university is making those available to students, as well as faculty and staff, to two cloth face coverings per, per person. Um, Tyson, was there, remind me of the first part of that question. Will there be additional masks provided to instructors in, in the case of students forgetting their masks? And I, I might be deferring that question to our facility staff, but I, I believe there, there will be a way to, to get those face coverings if needed online through, a request, through an online request, yes. Yes. Is a face shield considered a face covering equivalent to a mask for teachers in the classroom? And I can take that. Oh, did someone else want to take that? Okay, so we, this is something that has been posed to environmental health and safety to make sure that we can provide, um, the university can provide some alternatives in, in those situations where they're warranted. Um, so there are some face shields that do have a level of protection that we felt were comparable to a, a mask in limited situations. But unfortunately, a face shield by itself, because it's open on the sides, it really doesn't provide the same face um, protection. So what we've done is we've sourced through our procurement department a couple of acceptable options. Okay. And, and I did just want to say, sorry, say just something okay. very quickly about that. If you're finding that you were not able to teach in a manner that you believe is what's up to your standards and in the best interests of your students because of your covering. You have to have a covering, but come to CEDL, come to Terry. We will work with you and figure out how to find something that will allow you to enhance that rigor, but also be safe. And we also have an HR team that's available in addition to CEDL and EHS for employees who have concerns uh, related to their personal health associated with mask wearing. Um, so we would advocate um, they come through HR. Thank you. We are, uh, at the hour mark, I'd like to squeeze in one more question. Uh, the university is recommending technology to support online teaching, such as a headset, which is listed as required for instructors, and a device capable of live annotation. What is the university doing to provide instructors with this technology? So at this point, what would be most helpful, I've just talked to the deans about this. I, I mentioned that we have this working group in place. Bring your needs to your department, to your program, to essentially your supervisor, and let them know what those are. Hopefully, we will be able to figure it out within the context of existing resources. But if we need to do more than that, we have endeavored to do that. And so IT and the library and CEDL and others will be working together to figure out how we're able. Now, it, it could be in a variety of different ways. It could be a loaner. It could be 
um, something that would be part of other other hardware you might have gotten in the future. We want to do things in a way that are thoughtful, but we understand we have to particularly for some of our most marginalized, we have to be there and provide these resources. So we have we have those plans being pulled together. President Katsalias, I think that brings us to the end of the hour and we've covered a lot of ground and most of the questions that have been submitted. So I'll turn it back to you for any closing comments. Thank you, Tyson. Good job. Um, I, I want to add one thank you that I left off at the beginning, and that is Chris Delello's entire team in HR for their uh, unsung heroism and hard work. I'd like to thank the panelists for their knowledgeable their knowledge and leadership and the excellent answers to the questions. I'd like to thank the audience for your important and thoughtful questions. I hope you feel as proud as I do of our community and its response to this challenge. If there's a theme that came out of today's session, it's uh, relentless preparation combined with remaining flexible to whatever develops. I think that puts us in extremely good position uh, to, to handle the challenges ahead. I know that we will rely on our uh, formidable collective talents and sense of community uh, to keep us together as we navigate whatever waters lie ahead. So thanks to all of you, and I wish you a great afternoon and a healthy final week, final weeks of summer. Uh, see you soon.